Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm the dean of the Heinz College of Information Systems and uh, Public Policy, um, which is actually right across the street uh, for those of you uh, who are either on Poets and Quants or are new to Pittsburgh. And in a, the college is home to uh, two, two schools, the Information Systems School and the Public Policy School, a very CMU-esque melding of IT and, and public policy, and um, is a center of excellence on issues at the nexus of people, public policy and technology. And to reinforce what Bob said earlier this morning, um, the Block Center, I direct the Block Center, and it's, it's so much in the spirit of intersect at CMU, of really involving faculty and students in this amazing experience that we have uh, and are able to provide at CMU. So talking about people, policy, and technology, Facebook has been a pioneer in this space, uh, leading the world in creating community using technology. And as you might expect, a thought leader in this company has both a Pittsburgh and a CMU connection. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Jerome Pesenti, um, who's VP of AI uh, at Facebook. He and I go back to this is late 90s, as uh, when uh, Jerome began his journey here in, um, at CMU, and he'll, he's going to talk more about this. Uh, and he leads the company's AI research and applied AI teams. And he's been working in AI for the past 20 years um, in a number of roles, uh, including as CEO of Benevolent Tech, uh, the technology division of Benevolent AI, a British tech firm using AI to accelerate scientific discovery. Prior to that, um, at IBM Watson, actually right here in, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and then prior to that, a startup that he created, Vivissimo, which uh, was a tech firm specializing um, in text mining and enterprise search engines uh, that he co-founded in 2000. So without further ado, I know we are all very keen on hearing uh, Jerome want, speaking about AI today and tomorrow. So, Jerome. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Dean Krishnan. So, to start, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a bit of my life story, which is very much linked to this uh, place, to Pittsburgh, to CMU, and actually to Tepper as well. Uh, I came here. Uh, 20 years ago, I took a plane from Paris. Uh, I was actually a PhD student in mathematics. I had never actually coded a line in my life. Uh, and I realized after finishing my PhD in math that I wanted to have more impact in the world than just five people reading my PhD, okay? <laughs> so uh, I did study at the same time cognitive science. And then I found actually a faculty, Raul Valdez Perez, who was willing to invite me uh, and take a risk on a student who had never coded to come and visit as a scientist here. Actually, I came as, uh, uh, as part of my cooperation in France. I had to actually do a military service uh, at that time. But instead of crawling in the mud, because I had a degree, I could actually do some, some research in a foreign country. So here I am in the plane. And I remember in that plane, I actually had a little notebook where I, you know, I was supposed to come here for 16 months. And I said, what do I want to accomplish in these 16 months? Okay. My first line, I got to say, was, I want to date an American girl. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The, the second line is, I want to do some research in AI. And the third is, I want to actually learn about business. I had actually you know, imagined uh, 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 you know, mathematical, uh, uh, abstract mathematics in, in France. I had no clue about business. Okay. That was my three objectives. I'm a bit of an overachiever. So I actually have been here now for more than 20 years, actually 20 years almost to the day. Uh, I ended up marrying an American uh, woman and having four, uh, and having four American kids. Uh, I ended up actually spending my whole career uh, in AI. Uh, and I ended up actually learning a lot about business, basically starting businesses, selling them, buying some, uh, and uh, working for great, actually, American companies. Now, all these things actually have been very much linked to uh, this place. I mean, my wife actually was my neighbor. Uh, when I arrived here in Pittsburgh. Uh, obviously, AI, this is the place to do AI. And I had the, the, the chance when I came here to actually work with Herb Simon uh, for a little, a little bit. And obviously, business actually is an interesting story. I came here, uh, Raul, you know, who invited me, uh, you know, knew not much about me. And I had the opportunity actually to take some classes at Pepper. At the time, it was GSIA, OK? And I took some classes in accounting and classes in uh, psychology of management and took some classes in entrepreneurship. 
And Raul was like, what is this guy doing? Okay, why is he coming here and not taking some classes in business? Now, you know, 12 months later, we actually started a company together out of the research we did in CMU. And at the time, it was actually a company in AI before it was the whole hype. Uh, and, you know, we managed to grow it. And uh, Great Pittsburgh still exists here in Forbes and Moran, sell it, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very, very thankful for this place, for Pittsburgh, for CMU, and for Taper. Now, today, uh, I'd like to talk about AI. And I'm a bit of a pragmatic person. So I'd like to tell you, hey, what is AI for Facebook today? You know, I think there's a lot of hype around AI, a lot of buzz, uh, a lot of fear. But actually, you know, there are concrete things that companies do. I mean, AI is actually really at the core of what Facebook does, but it may not be actually ev evident for, uh, for many people. And I want to show actually how we are trying to use AI to do really good things at Facebook and, and in the world. And then I'd like to look a little bit you know, in the future. I know the, 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 the theme for the day is the future. Future is, is a long thing. So I, I call it tomorrow, because I can tell you maybe what can happen you know, tomorrow and in the near future, in the long-term future, it's much harder to predict, actually. The people who have done that in AI often made some uh, wacky uh, prediction that, uh, that didn't reveal uh, truth. So I'm going to be a little bit more cautious and tell you what challenges we're seeing for the near future, both on the research side, what are the avenues that we see to get a more general intelligence. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about also engineering problems. You know, how do we create a platform uh, to develop AI? And then I'll tell you about some ethical actually issues and methodological issues around, around AI. So let's start with, with Facebook. What people don't realize is that actually AI is the, the core of Facebook's business. Every day, people come on Facebook and actually spend 67 years of life okay, on our apps. What they see is actually determined by an algorithm that uses machine learning and deep learning. Okay? It is an algorithm that tries to basically match you with the things that you can find interesting, understand the content, understand people, and try to match them. It also tries to present you with ads, which is the majority of the revenue that uh, Facebook uh, uh, gathers. So it's a core of uh, our business, and it allows us to run the company and provide the best experience. Lately, you must have heard, obviously, that Facebook is a platform that's used by many, many actors. And sometimes people post things that are not the most beneficial, from you know, pornography to violence to clickbait, uh, like presented here, to hate speech, to bullying, etc. And we have basically a mandate uh, to catch this bad behavior. Now, when you have 2 billion users submitting content constantly, it's impossible for humans to basically catch all that content. So we actually use algorithms to understand everything that's posted on the platform, from you know, your text to your uh, images to the video to the speech. And we try to understand and we need to use that AI to flag it to human moderators so they can make a decision as to if it's appropriate or not. Now, we don't just use AI for uh, you know, protecting. We also use AI to enhance the experience on the platform. So for example, when you ask your friend for an advice, the system changes the UI automatically by recognizing the language you ask and provide a dedicated experience for all your friends to provide recommendation to what you want. It also uh, allows you to translate. So we actually have thousands of languages on the platform, and we support thousands of language pair translation automatically so that you can actually converse with your friends from a different country, a different language. The system also provides suggestions when you text. You know, it's about to anticipate what you're trying to do and help you actually do it. And there are many, many other uh, usage. Let me actually list some, a few more. Uh, you ever heard of bots? So there are actually hundreds of thousands of bots running on the Messenger platform, all of them powered by some form of AI. We are able to understand videos that you're posting and generate trailers and thumbnails automatically so that you can have a preview of what they have about. And then there's this whole uh, direction for Facebook, which is to look at uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. And AI is really at the core of that. It's at the core of the AR and VR experience and enables it. But also, AI is used really to enhance uh, and help communities. One thing we do pretty well is that we allow people who are blind or have visual impairment to really use fully the platform by describing what's on pictures and video automatically. We're also able to um, catch some uh, interesting events on the platform. One is to actually understand if people uh, are expressing a will to actually harm themselves. And in the past year, actually, we have had more than a thousand uh, interaction with a first responder 
to basically send people out of their home and make sure that they were actually OK based on the interaction we actually uh, catch on the platform. We also managed to, to match blood donors with people who need blood in countries like India and Pakistan. And we have done, found more than 8 million blood donors through the interaction in the platform by automatically understanding that interaction and proposing a match. We're also looking at things outside even the platform. Uh, my team is, is world class in vision, and we have a lot of new techniques that we can use to generate images and extrapolate them. And we are partnering with NYU to accelerate MRI. MRI today takes an hour. You have to stay in the, uh, in the machine. It's very hard for children to do that. And we are aiming to do that 10 times faster using systems that can extrapolate images. But ultimately, really, why I came to Facebook and the role of AI is really to make sure that the experience that we have in AI is beneficial to people. Okay? For a long time, there was this idea of trying to optimize for time spent and for engagement. But right now, we're trying to create algorithms that go beyond that, understand people and content and interaction to optimize not just the time spent, but really the value that the platform brings to you. Is it making you happy? Is it making you uh, more informed? And we are trying to create algorithms that understand this interaction to optimize for that. Now, it's not easy to do that. Believe me, some of the things I mentioned today are very complicated to do, especially when you try to look at some interaction. For example, trying to catch hate speech is very, very difficult. And doing that in Burmese uh, is even more difficult, or in 200 languages. So we are every day trying to improve the performance of our AI system, and it's critical to be able to function properly. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, this problem, or how do we enhance uh, AI. The first thing I want to tell you is that if you had asked me, you know, I've been in this field for 20 years now. If you had asked me like six or seven years ago where we would be today, I would not have been able to predict the advances. Honestly, these advances have actually superseded the, the prediction of most of the experts. Vision is especially interesting. You know, in 2012, we started to be able to recognize objects and images. And here, through the sequence, you can see the progress. After that, we were able to understand uh, the, the mask of the image, understand the skeleton of uh, the people in the image. And then, just this year, we were starting to be able to do that in real time, on a phone. You know, as you point your camera, we are able to understand your motion. And just recently, we published a new uh, algorithm to be able to do that in 3D. So we are able to understand, just out of the video you take out of your phone, the 3D surface uh, of your body. So it's clear that we are making great progress, and these progress are not slowing down. And this is why companies like Facebook are investing so much in AI today. Now, there is some interesting aspect to this evolution. This is actually a, a graph put a, in a blog by OpenAI, which is a, another lab doing very interesting AI. And it, it shows you that uh, basically a amount of computation necessary to do this kind of state-of-the-art uh, uh, AI progress is increasing exponentially, basically 10x each year. Okay. Now, the conclusion that OpenAI had out of that, blog, out of that curve is a little bit different from mine, okay? and I'll tell you why. So their conclusion is to say, well, you know, this curve is going to keep happening. That means we really need to make hardware much faster because it's going to cost us a lot. But actually, if you look at the cost, I will tell you a little bit, the experiments at the top here are starting to cost around a few million dollars for each training event, okay? which means the overall experiment so it's costing tens of millions of dollars. And I could tell you that even for the Facebook and the Google of the world, we're not going to get experiments that are going to cost 10 times that more next year and 100 times more uh, in, 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 in two years. So what it tells us is that actually this is going to stop. The brute force approach that we have been using to throw a lot of data while working very well is basically reaching some limits. And we have limits in computing and limits in data. And so that would mean that we are going to start doing things differently. There are a little bit of two types of experiment in there. One type of experiment is that you try to create a lot of labeled data. So you try to show the system a huge number of uh, examples. It's called supervised learning. And basically, let it to learn from that. And we have, learned, we have found that the more, you feed, the more data you feed, the better it works. Okay? But the problem is that you have to generate that data. And the second type of experiment here is what we call model-free reinforcement learning. You let the system in an environment, and it will actually kind of learn everything about that environment. But most of the experiments they are done in what I would say non-real life environment, more limited, like the game of Go. Okay, so let me suggest some some paths to go beyond that. Uh, you know, the problem a bit of these two approaches I mentioned is that they are very much like learning uh, in a way that's 
most actually kids don't do early in their childhood. It's more akin to what we do in, in a university where it's a, it's a you know, lab environment, if you want, with someone telling you what you're supposed to learn. Okay? But what we know is that most humans, especially early in their life, actually learn more by observation. Actually, rarely they are told exactly what to do. And they spend a huge amount of time just observing. And they do it in the real world, okay? not in a lab. So that gives us some ideas of where we should go. Let me give you some examples of, of things we have been doing. One example I mentioned is task of basically trying to identify objects in image. It's, called, it's a task called ImageNet. It's a task actually that revolutionized uh, the, uh, the perception of AI and introduced deep, deep learning to uh, the AI community. But it was done by, again, what I mentioned earlier, having a lot of people labeling actually, I think, 14 million images. Now, 14 Im million images, that sounds like a lot. But actually, at Facebook, we have billions of images. Okay? And this is actually Instagram images, and we have billions of images that actually people tag. Now, they don't tag it so that you, you know, tag it very well. Sometimes the tags are kind of random, but you have billions of ima images available with billions of tags. And so we did an experiment to use these tags and try to learn from that. And what we found, a bit like the previous tag, is that the more data you feed the system, and if you feed 3.5 billion images with these tags, it's actually able to learn and, and to recognize any kind of other images with other labels uh, better. And we actually improved the state of the art today, uh, this year on this. Now, what's interesting, again, is in this task is that we just took the data that's there, not data that we created for it. So we just got observe the way people tag information without having to really craft it just for the task. It's called actually weekly supervised learning. And it does some very interesting thing. Actually, it also allows you to create uh, labeling and, and captions on pictures that is you know, much more uh, uh, real world and, and better quality. Let me give you another example, actually, one of my favorites. Uh, it's about machine translation. So the traditional way of doing machine translation, again, is to feed the system an enormous amount of uh, parallel data, example of the translation. Actually, the whole field started with translation of laws in in Canada between French and English, and it was a huge corpus that you could feed a system. But now we are able to create a system that's able to translate from one language to another without ever seeing a single example of a translation. And it's a beautiful uh, system that basically tries to you know, represent the language of each language independently, English and let's say an Urdu, in their own space. It's used some, a system called embeddings, which is you put that in a high dimensional space and you know, the words that are similar like cats and dogs usually are vectors that are quite similar. And what we found is that you can actually look at the space of English words and the space of Urdu words, let's say, and you can start mapping them and learn to map one to the other without ever telling the system which is which. Okay? And from that, we're able to create a system that can actually craft pretty good translation, which for languages where you have very few examples in the order of 10,000, 100,000 sentences, it actually worked better to be completely what's called unsupervised. So the system just observes the language, and from that is able to intuit how to do translation. That, in my opinion, is the future of machine learning. Another example, oh, and actually this video, is to actually do uh, self-supervised learning with robots in the real world. Okay? Test and try and experiment. What's not neat about this is actually it was done here at CMU and in collaboration with Facebook. And now we have a common lab together to do this kind of experiment. And we're trying something even more interesting, which is to try to do it in actually people's home. Uh, we actually rented some Airbnb uh, to put some cheap robots that will do that there. And amazingly, what it shows is that when you do it in the real world like this, you actually learn much faster uh, than if you, if you do it in a lab. So these are some paths, you know. Go beyond supervision, go beyond uh, artificial environment, go to the real world uh, and learn from observing and doing and interacting. These, in my opinion, are the best path to, to get to AGI. Now, uh, what I didn't show you uh, in, uh, in my presentation so far is the curve of how much computing resources we use at Facebook for AI, okay? Uh, I won't show it because it actually gives me uh, the chills because you know, that's a pretty high bill and it keeps increasing. But there's a bit of a dirty secret of AI today, and which is why there's a bit of this cognitive dissonance around it. And I'll give you a little anecdote that I got from one of our uh, cloud partners. Okay? So you have the cloud vendors out there and what they told me is that their own consumption of AI actually is today 
greater by an order of magnitude than the sum of all the AI done by their millions of customers. And what it tells you is that you have a handful of companies doing today doing a huge amount of machine learning. So I'll give you one data point is that today on Facebook, we do 200 trillion inferences a day. Okay? Even if we have 2 billion users, that means we are doing 100,000 inferences per day. Every 100,000 times we predict something. But it's very much concentrated in a small number of companies. And the reality of actually AI and business is not yet there. Not what it tells you, though, usually this kind of company, we are able to, in my opinion, see what's going to happen. So we're pretty clear, uh, sure that other companies will follow uh, that path. But it's not that easy to do that. And I'll propose a little bit some, some ideas how to get there. The first thing I would say is that at Facebook, actually, we're not selling AI to anybody, so we are really eager for the state of AI to increase. Remember, I told you we have this problem, which is pretty big, of moderating everything that happens on our platform. And the better AI works, even if it's not developed by ourselves, the better we are. Okay? So it's really important for us that the state of the AI increase. And one thing we do is that we collaborate with universities. And I mentioned the research that I've shown before. It was done actually with, with CMU, and we have a big partnership with CMU, but also with many other universities out there. So we really very much see AI, and especially AI research, as an open endeavor that needs to be done with other partners, in particular uh, university labs. Now, one of our challenges that we face internally is also to take this research and put it into production. It's actually not easy to do that. And when actually I came into Facebook, we actually had a system for research, which was called PyTorch, and a system for uh, production, the thing that's doing 200 trillion prediction a day. And these two actually have very different constraints. You know, when you're in research, you want to explore, you want to be quick, you want to iterate fast. When you're in production, especially when it costs you, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every time you do something, you want to be very, very careful. But the problem today is you want to move fast. And you want to be able to go from research to production as quickly as possible. That's one of the problems we are trying to solve today. And we are releasing a new system uh, in the next few days, uh, which is called PyTorch 1.0, which combines this idea of research to production. And that's really the future of exploration. You want to be able to take you know, a system that you develop in research and put it into production in a matter of weeks and months. The system I show you to do unsupervised learning will be used this year. You know, the paper came out just a few weeks ago. And it will be put in production this year to translate uh, uh, unusual languages on Facebook. Now, the other thing we want to do is to provide the foundation of AI to other companies. And so everything we do in research on Facebook, we put it out there as open source for people to be able to use and build on. Again, our interest is for people to improve the state of the art so we can use it internally and be a more efficient platform. So everything we do, we try to put in open source. This is the first step of getting a platform for AI that will actually enable a lot more companies and people to do it. Start from you know, a, a, a framework for deep learning and then create all these libraries so you can understand vision, speech, text, without having to reinvent the wheel. But this is really the first step of this transformation. There are huge engineering problems to AI. I mean, I've been in software engineering for the past 20 years, and the comparison I give is that we do AI today the same way we were doing software engineering 20 years ago. I mean, when I started in that field, I told you I was not a very good coder. I had never coded before. But two years later, I was starting a company writing 10,000 lines of code you know, every day uh, to get the product done. These days, you realize that's not the way to do it. We had no testing, no, uh, no source control, et cetera, et cetera. But today, I will tell you that the state of development uh, of AI is pretty much similar to 20 years ago. We don't know how to test systems that are not actually deterministic. Uh, we don't know how to control for the data changes and for the model changes. There are lots of problems. One anecdote I will tell you, we have this great system we call PyTorch. I told you it's, it's better than SciBrain. Yet some of our researchers you know, posted on, on Facebook saying, hey, you know, I was able to create my model in literally 10 minutes, but it took me two days to debug to realize I had made a stupid mistake. Okay? We don't have actually really the good infrastructure and ecosystem today to do the engineering of AI, and that needs to be invented. Now, there are really, really tricky problems about this. Because when you use AI and, and systems that do prediction, you can make some very subtle mistakes. Let me show you one. This is actually some research that was done by uh, an engineer, uh, actually a researcher in my team from Africa, who looked actually at the system I mentioned earlier doing image prediction. This system actually that on paper and the paper that we published tell you that they are as good as human. Okay? And what you'll see here is an immediate bias. Okay? 
because the system is fed some images that rep represent a certain bias, it will actually associate uh, a certain sport with a certain ethnicity. Okay? And these were systems that were supposed to be state of the art. Okay? Now, you will say in this case, this is just about sports. So it doesn't have a lot of implication. But I will show you in a moment how this implication can be really far reaching. So it's really important that we understand how we get to these problems. Now, the problem of this bias actually comes not from the computer, but actually comes from people. And the problem of AI today is that it learns from people, and people have biases. And these biases go into the data that's used to train the system. And then the algorithm, if we don't pay attention to it, will basically amplify these biases and then make them maybe sometimes reinforce them. Let me give you an example that's much more impactful than just detecting a spot. Imagine you're trying to do uh, a jobs recommendation, which we do today as Facebook, right? Now, there are different categories of people that you're going to recommend jobs to. Let's say you can actually organize people as male, female, and a certain age range, right? Now, what if when you're offering jobs to people, you're discriminating against their category and offering them different types of opportunity? You can imagine the broad impact of that, right? If a subpopulation is presented with a, a certain type of job, but let's say all the computer science jobs are only presented to, uh, to white male, OK? This thing is that if you don't pay attention, you could actually reproduce the bias that already exists in society. Now, it's very complicated to do this because not all biases are actually are bad. When you select people for a job, you usually try to bias by them being competent, and you expect them to be good in a job. So these are very, very, very difficult problem. We don't have all the solution, but you need to basically analyze this algorithm and try to really understand why they are bad. But I'll tell you one reason, one thing that will make it better, and to conclude my, my presentation. It's a little example that uh, Joël Pinot, who uh, reports to me in my team and leads the Montreal uh, lab, told me that once she was actually called uh, to uh, help design a system for voice recognition in a helicopter cockpit, OK? And she arrived there, and she started testing the system, and it performed extremely poorly. Yet everybody in the room tells it it's, it's state-of-the-art and performs very well. Guess what had happened? The system had only been tested with male, OK? And they had not bothered even to train it with a single female voice. But having just her come into that team and be part of that team changed the dynamic. All of a sudden, they understood the limitation of the system. And I will tell you that the most important thing we can do today to address this problem is to bring people into the field who come from diverse backgrounds. We really need AI to be a set of people developing AI who understand these biases, who leave them every day, and who understand them so that they can make sure that the systems that are being developed don't have these biases. Anyway, this concludes my presentation. I wanted to show you that really we are using AI today. It's a reality, maybe more in certain companies like Facebook than others. We're trying to use it to do good, but there are some challenges around you know, how to expand it to really uh, uh, general intelligence, how to actually engineer it, and how to make sure that it doesn't have biases with the wrong implication. Thank you. Please join me once again in thanking Jerome. I want to emphasize what uh, President Jahanian said about um, the, the, our sweet spot being at this intersection of uh, the future of business, tech, and society. And I think the talk really amply illustrated the various opportunities that lie at that intersection. Very early on in his talk, he talked about masala dosas. And I know those of you who are from India, that's a signal that lunch is on the way. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know that um, lunch is outside. Uh, but we'd like to encourage you to stop by the Schwartz Center uh, for Entrepreneurs, um, for Entrepreneurship on Level 3. Uh, there are several companies who are part of the center who are showcasing the innovations. And that's another really important uh, theme of uh, Carnegie Mellon entrepreneurship and innovation. So have lunch, check out the Schwartz Center, and come back after lunch. Thank you again. Yeah.